This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So this week on the podcast, I have back on my friend Marlon Holden. Uh, So Marlon Holden is Grey Light Hunter on Instagram. Uh, We've had a couple great conversations. So today is a a longer episode, and we just um, we get into his hunt on Tiburon Island, uh, some of his hunts this season, and, and just what's making the difference for him in being consistently successful on big mule deer. So. Uh, it's a it's a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I think you guys will too. We'll get right into it. Just want to thank a couple sponsors. So I want to thank Zamberlin Boots. So Marlin also uses Zamberlin Boots. And the great thing about Zamberlin is they have a bunch of different offerings for your different preferences on boots and shoes. So I know Marlin likes to use a, a boot and they have some great ones. Uh, I like to use uh, their their shoe so their shoe is built like a little bit burlier for the mountains it's got a vibram sole which has great grip they're built waterproof um, the waterproof capabilities on Zamberlin are second to none uh, these guys just don't cut any corners as far as quality as far as craftsmanship in fact they take every Gore-Tex booty and they test it individually to make sure it won't leak uh, so I just know that their boots and shoes keep waterproof uh, way longer than anything I've ever used, the life of the shoe or the boot. So I like those Salute shoes. Those things have been great for me. Um, there's also uh, like the, the Free Blast is a great one. Um, and, and then as far as their, their boots, they have a lot of low cut uh, models. So they make that Salute in a low cut, which is a great like low cut boot to be able to be hiking in and then they also have some higher cuts or some more mountain boots Uh, just great offerings great boots and shoes so check those guys out over at zamberlin.com i also want to thank sig sour optics i am so impressed by sig sour optics so that last episode we're giving away a pair of those zulu 6 image stabilizing binos uh there's a, a link either in the eastman's elevated Instagram page or there's a link on last podcast in the description and so you can enter to win those Zulu 6 image stabilizing binos. Uh, They're great. It's like glassing off a tripod everywhere you go. If it's windy you can still have a stable image. I really like the 12 by 42s. I also like the 16 by 42s in my pack. They have a set of 20s and a set of 10s as well so you can check those out. Also check out their standard binoculars. Uh, they just revamped this line. It's just amazing glass in there. So uh, I have a pair of 15s that I'll tripod up. I also have a pair of 10 by 42s for standard use. And it's just um, great, really good glass to look through. Uh, great light capabilities. Christmas from like edge to edge. Uh, just great products. They also have rifle scopes. They have uh, spotting scopes. Uh, you can check out their rangefinder. I'm using that Kilo 5K. I think it's the best rangefinder on the market. And I just love everything these guys are doing. So uh, make sure to check them out. We really appreciate their support here on Eastman's Elevated. I also want to thank Black Ovis. So Black Ovis is an internet retail shop. You can get absolutely everything you need for your next hunt. Uh, they have a knowledgeable staff. They carry all the top name brands as well as their own name brand. Uh, and you can save 10% by putting in the promo code ELEVATED10 and uh, get 10% off that order, which is huge. So any uh, upgrades on gear that you have to make this year, just go check them out, see if they have what you're looking for. So thanks to those guys, Black Ovis, for their support of the podcast. Over at Eastman's, um, yeah, we've just been working away, just got a article done for the next magazine about executing on animals. Um, there's also I've got a really good podcast I recorded last night with Sean Melland. Uh, he's not on many podcasts, hasn't had social media like he's just had it for a couple weeks, but he's on our cover of the next issue. And he has killed 
seven of the last eight years on bulls that average over three hundred and seventy five inches. it's just incredible. so i can't wait to check out that article. so you can get that article. we have six issues of the eastman's bow hunting journal six issues of the eastman's hunting journal that come out per year so yeah we just pour our heart and soul into that magazine so check that thing out check out our beyond the grid the other podcast we have uh, I've got a review. That's right. I got to sit down. I've got one of my hunts from last year that I've got to review. The the film. We've pretty much got the rough cut done, so I'll be excited to release that to you guys. And then um, check out our other podcast. You can check out my other podcast I do with Dan Bacar, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Life of a Bow Hunter. Uh, that podcast is doing really well and a lot of fun. Can't wait to catch up with Dan this week and hear all about his New Zealand red stag hunt. So stoked on that. And, um, man, with that, let's get into this podcast. It's a great one. So Marlon Holden, uh, Great Light Hunter on Instagram. I'm your host, Brian Barney, Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. Experiences of your own from this season where, you know, you, you either got an animal or you didn't get an animal. Either way, it didn't matter much. You were just stoked to be in that moment. And it's interesting how when we are, when we go to a show, for example, you go there And like I was mentioning, it's harder, faster, better, stronger. Like everybody's got the testosterone pumping like crazy. And you're sitting here going, wow, like, I guess I can keep up with this. But a lot of it's a show. And and I'm not I'm not saying in any uh, capacity that it isn't real. Like it's it's very real. Like I go to the gym six days a week now and, you know, we're getting ready to leave on a week long trip to go run across the West. And I'm going to do some scouting and checking out different. Uh, habitats and stuff and just looking to see how things are going post rut recovery wise i'm going to get up on some mountains i'm going to look for some animals i'm going to see where the the bucks have shed and where they have it and kind of but i'm going to cover you know uh southern california utah uh arizona and um look at a little bit of colorado i'm going to be gone for nine days and we're just going to cover a bunch of country and go into a different a bunch of different habitats and check some of this stuff out And so I'll be covering a lot of miles when I'm gone doing that. So it's not all show, but I guess the part of it is, is that when you and I connect, we have very authentic, very like, I don't want to say soft, just heartfelt warrior wisdoms, right? They're no longer, uh, hey, can you do it? Like, how good are you at doing it? It's kind of like, oh, bro, like, tell me about your experiences and uh, you know, how was the wind treating you this year? I remember last year in the high country, I couldn't catch a break with the wind. Uh, it seemed like every stock I went on, the wind was just like the most disruptive beast that there was. And I couldn't get it right. And this year, uh, even if I waited for the thermals, right? And this year, you know, it was like one stock, one kill. It's really kind of a interesting interaction between nature and ourselves as as we age and and being adults and as i get long-winded here how cool it is to to see um our evolution and i and i thoroughly enjoy the realness uh, of the the conversations that's really what resonates with me and connects with me the greatest uh as i get older 100 percent. it's um it was just saying before i hit record that um I'm just so excited to get you on the podcast and my mind just starts racing the minute, you know, that I know we're going to connect or that I hit record. There's so many things I want to talk over, but yeah, um, man, the winds, the, the winds in those mountains can, and in the desert and anywhere we hunt, they can be so fickle. And it seems like just one wrong little gust can, can, can catch or can ruin a stock. And it, and it, it feels so right like to have this higher understanding of the winds, the thermals and the directionals and how they work through the, the mountainscape and like knowing those winds does make you better at hunting those landscapes, but it doesn't change the fact that, that one little swirl of that wind can ruin everything. Even if you have the thermals, right? Like you were saying, um, man, it can be so frustrating. Can it? Yeah, it's really wild. I actually just, you know, did a little segment on this where I started talking about it. Um, even, even the small nuances of the diurnal shift, right? Like how a lot of people will sit there and listen to this and say, oh yeah, I, I definitely know what he's talking about. You know how it gets really, really cold, right? At sunrise, people are like, 
I don't know why, but I was freezing my butt off sunrise. We spent two hours hiking up the mountain, and even though we were sweating and it was cold, for whatever reason, the wind kicked up and it was super cold right when the sun started coming up. And, like, understanding those subtle nuances of diurnal shift and how they play a role based off of the weather, how it can be a lot warmer on cloudy days when it would seem that it would be a lot colder, but it's not. And the clear days are super, super cold versus the cloudy days that keep the the heat in and make it warmer and how those microclimates affect the hunt how the weather affects the hunt and all we've done over the years over the decades is just gather a little bit of mental data from each hunt from from each season from each set of circumstances that lets us sit there and go into a stock going i don't care if i only put on one stock as long as it's the right stock Whereas before it was like, man, I'm going to do, you know, as many stocks as I can. Because, like, I still believe it's a game of numbers and averages, but the numbers and averages game tends to, like, sway more in the direction of I'm going to, like, be a lot more efficient with my time and plan the right one now versus just going in for the hell of it. Unless it's a super, super tough hunt and I'm not getting any stocks and the wind's messed up and you're, like, just throwing a Hail Mary because, you know, you're not getting anything else. But <laughs> It seems for sure very evident that, you know, time goes by really uh, kind of honing in. Okay, Mother Nature has the set of rules. And I either have to get on board with learning them or I'm going to keep failing. And um, and that, that, that failure part's not fun. No, it, it cuts deep and it hurts so bad. And that's why you learn from it, you know, is like when we make a mistake, but failure is the prerequisite to success. And the only reason I'm any good at bow hunting mule deer is, is I've made every mistake in the book and I've been too aggressive. I've been too passive. I've went in with a, with the wrong wind and, and you're right throughout the years, the odds go up and I'm not so much concerned about the numbers game like you anymore. Like a it seems like if I can get a good stock or a couple good stocks on a hunt, I can make it happen. And this, that higher understanding of the wind, you know, I, I say it like, like different species in different habitats improves your skills in different ways. And so like hunting spring black bear, like their, their scent, they can smell seven times what a bloodhound can smell, you know? And so if you get busted on a stock, it's because they winded you. And so, you know, it's made me really like a lot better at reading uh, directional winds that are coming in, hunting the strong wind side. And there's some hillsides that mule deer bed on or that live on that it's impossible to stalk them unless you get that west wind or unless you get that south wind. But if they're hanging on the lee wind side towards that top third, it seems like even if I have the thermals right, those directionals will overpower over the top and be like a washing machine over the top. And I get busted and sometimes you get it right. It's like one out of five stocks work out there. But I've learned over the years that when those situations aren't right to not push it. And it's, it is this set of rules that mother nature teaches us, but it's like, not like hard rules, like creative thinking is rewarded in the, uh, you know, in bow hunting mule deer and, 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 and reading winds and, and making these ground rules for when you're, when you'll stock and when you won't is going to be different per the individual, you know, what they prefer to stock deer, whether it's bedded or on their feet, what time of year it is, the terrain, the the cover. And so you have to like start to make up your own rules as you go and realize what's a high percentage and a low percentage, but it is all gray area. It's not like black and white, like this is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. But through experience, like you start to build that inside yourself, which then in turn gives you a better chance at success when you find a big buck. Thousand percent. Like yeah. I, I've definitely, you know, over, after speaking with a few very, very efficient killers, yourself included, it's interesting to see the dynamic of uh, how these bow hunters go about truly maximizing their time in the field, their effectiveness, efficiency. Uh, and, you know, a lot of us, like we have multiple hunts, not just one or two. And so we're kind of trying to pack more into less time and needing to be as efficient as possible. I have, like, I, I think if I remember correctly, you know, you like to wait for them to stand up. 
Whereas me, if I have them in their bed, they're going to die right in their bed. Like I will never wait for them to stand up. Now that goes to show two very highly effective people, but really two separate strategies and both of them work. And I've found that the numbers kind of test out differently for my method, but I guarantee you we'd sit on a hill and think, think, uh, I would say in the high 90th percentile, very similar in our approach and how we, you know, would access drainage and where we would like consider glassing from and where we would, you know, a stocking route. I think we would all pick it out really quick. And a lot of it I, to a high degree is going to be, um, very much so about the wind and never about, you know, what camel pattern you're wearing or, uh, any of that, that would almost never come into play. It would mostly be about your experience based off of what nature throws at you and, and how to read those conditions um, to serve you best, given your strategy and style. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that is wild. Like uh, there there are so many uh, correlations and similarities in how we'd look at the landscape or how we'd hunt it. But there are those differences. And, and I think we both have our reasons behind it. And I think you have great reasons. And when I listen to you talk about hunting mule deer and shooting them in their bed, that makes sense to me from the wind swirling. And if you can put a good arrow in them, it's time to put a good arrow. Me, I kind of find like when they're hidden in their bed, I don't want to expose myself to try to get the shot. I'd rather just get in close and then let it play out. So I'm keeping that element of surprise. And also I find that a lot of times their spine is turned towards me. And that's like that shot is really tough to make. It's not as big of a window as a broadside deer, especially if I've got that spine turned towards me. And like I say, I always feel like I'm exposing myself to try to get the shot, but you're dang good at shooting those things in their bed and getting a good arrow into them. And I do like shooting at them in their bed because it's kind of like the pressure's off. You can really take your time with your execution and place your arrow, right? Like what, what percentage of bucks do you think you kill in their bed? Oh, it's, I, I don't know what I've said in the past, but I'm going to venture to say it's 80th percentile. So the interesting part is, and here's a key takeaway, I think, that when you shoot them in your bed, you don't always have a good exit. So when you don't have a good exit, a lot of times the arrow will stop on the ground on the other side, causing uh, that lower exit hole to not bleed sometimes, or maybe not as much. So in some cases you have to wait for the blood to pool up inside to be able to start coming out the entrance. If they're going downhill uh, after the execution of the arrow, oftentimes it doesn't matter. The blood will start pouring out of the top. Um, But, you know, it's amazing how many times you'll actually break the back. Like you'll, you'll actually stone them right in their bed Um, and you'll, you'll crack their back and run down and put another one in them. So there's different types of things that occur when you shoot them in their bed. But, you know, for example, like that Wyoming high country, just it's not, I wouldn't say it is as conducive because it's not as, I'm not saying it isn't as steep. There's a lot of areas that I can say that are steeper than heck that are just gnarly cliffed out, you know, shots are straight down, but there's different high countries, right? And some high countries are open and, you can pull off bedded shots because you're coming over the top of a rim. Uh, you're in tundra and you're peeking over. You're in low desert uh, where you can see different angles and kind of play that find a hole game. And there's other country that like, you know, you could look at those strips of pines in that more roll. Once you get up on top in the Wyoming high country where it kind of like, rolls a little bit more gently and then there's the strips of timber where to be honest like you might be better off waiting for them to feed out just simply because there's not enough of a roll in the land to start sneaking in too tight without them seeing you like that so you 
I think there's, you know, more than one way to slice it. And that's where just thinking on your feet comes into play more than anything else. Like it's, it's more the country that you're hunting in. It says a lot. So like your shots and what you do as a hunter says a lot about where you hunt a lot more than how you hunt it. Like my strategy of shooting them in their bed might be because I'm shooting, shooting deer and maybe more open terrain. Maybe uh, I'm shooting deer in country that's more conducive to sneaking in to change angles to get that shot without being seen. Um, and, you know, I think that if you have country that is more open, but it's cliffy and rimy or, you know, you have low brush that you can kind of make angles on things, you can get away with rerouting and executing a shot in a bed. Like if you don't like an angle, move around and get another, you know, angle on it. Whereas there's certain country, I wouldn't even try it because you're like, wow, I'm within, you know, 50 yards trying to switch up angles. And the reality is, is that these animals can, you know, they can see me at some point, like one's going to catch me because like, uh, a fact is that they have like a 200, what is it? A 270 degree view. So they technically can kind of like see behind their head almost. Whereas our vision, like my peripheral I can barely see that right here. Like, yeah, and they're like way behind. So it's like you have to be dead behind them for them not to see you or moving so slow they don't pick you up. So you could technically be in plain sight and move super slow to where that doesn't come up on the radar, which I've done a million times. Or you have to be dead behind their head. But if you don't know and you're coming in blind, you don't have anybody on a radio, nobody giving you hand signals, and you're just kind of like trying to skirt in the last 300 yards, hoping that they're in a piece of timber that they're going to be hidden, but going to be open enough to give you a shot is like almost dreaming, right? So I, I think that uh, that the strategy depends on the country you're hunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So we, gave, we, we gave away a little bit on where we hunt, if people mm -hmm. are listening to this. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and also the season that you're going to hunt. It seems like, you know, if we're talking about that Wyoming, it's a September season where it isn't too long into that season where they start shedding their velvet and go into secondary living where they're way more timbered up, where it's a lot tougher to move in on them on their bed. So season will play a role in it as well. And um, yeah, I think... Um, it's wild, man. These, um, the deer, like, I think that's why you've got hooked on mule deer is they are the ultimate challenge. And I, I get reminded of it hunting mule deer. Like I have got more proficient over the years for sure, but then I'll just get a tough hunt thrown at me where they just catch me or I'm hunting rutting bucks and the, the does pick me up or the wind swirled or the, and it just reminds me like how switched on these things are or hunting them in snow that crunches. And it's like, you can hardly get into bow range of them because they just hear you coming. They are the ultimate challenge. Like their instincts are so keen and everybody wants a giant mule deer. And, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely, you know, some guys that have killed some, some good bucks with their bow, but to do it consistently is so difficult and so i think they really keep you on your toes and i can hear the experience like as you talk like talk about your movement and this is all stuff like you've compiled a lot of this information on that new app right like the gray light app yeah i'm i i try to update several modules a month and just put little things that i can think of like this month i talked about um so I, I lived out of my Hilleberg Acto for uh, 34 days. Um, you know, I, I've never done that before. I've lived out of my tent for five to eight days at a time, but I've never lived out of a tent for 34 days. And I've never been so far disconnected away from civilization, meaning like you land, you drive a car three hours, you get in a ponga, uh, cross uh, an eight mile straight. Then you do like a five and a half, six hour, four by four off road vehicle ride to like the middle of nowhere and then hike in from there and all your water is with you. Like I've never been so cut off or isolated where you have no phone, no nothing. You're just, well, you do, but it's via in reach. For, you know, eight days at a time, 10 days at a time, 
before you have to go get water. You bring enough water to, you know, go back and forth to the vehicle, which is seven to 12 miles away, depending on where you're at. Um, I've never been so cut off. So I was, if I wanted to see what was going on with business, did something happen where I need to make a decision? Is my family okay? That you truly had things that you could rely on. I've never been so reliant on something before other than, you know, walking six miles out of a trailhead and being like, plug it in. Right. Or a burger's just as far as, you know, a 30 minute, an hour long car ride and you're back somewhere where you could grab a burger, or catch a shower or something. And, and, uh, I've never been in a situation in, in my hunting, um, you know, experiences where I've been so cut off that I had to rely on a solar panel to stay in touch and let people know that I was okay. Uh, so I updated a couple modules on, you know, living in a tent for 34 days, uh, relying on a solar panel for your battery energy, um, just really kind of leveraging the assets that you have to, um, you know, make sure that the hunt that you're on is, is not only, um, that, that you've prepared well, but that the preparations you've made, uh, would account for things being, you know, maybe not necessarily so known, lots of unknowns. And once you're there, you're in a foreign country. It's not like you can just, oh, uh, can you have FedEx send me something to the nearest address and give like a, a mail center an address where you are in Nevada or something and have something sent out real quick or replaced. It's like you came with uh, X, Y, and Z. And if you didn't bring it, well, guess what, buddy, you're not. Like I had... A, a little bit long-winded here, but I had a couple of interesting failures that uh, I've never had before that were kind of um, like crucial. I, for example, I brought two releases with me. Now, this isn't anything wrong with the release, right? Like the release was perfectly fine. However, um, when you're hunting, when I'm hunting, I, I don't shoot every day. I don't, I get up before dark and I'm up on the mountain glassing. I don't shoot every day. I might shoot once a week or something, you know, if there's a, a little bit of time in the middle of the day and, you know, I'll have like a, a small game head in the quiver just to do some stump shooting. Uh, I might do that every now and then, but it's not every day. Well, that environment, you're at sea level, but there's a lot hum more humidity in the air and everything was gumming up on me. I've never had this happen. It was the strangest thing ever where my caliper on the release froze up solid. Like it, it wouldn't move. And I noticed a couple days earlier as I was working it, because I put it on, I, was, I would work it a little bit and it was getting a little gummy. Well, two days later, the thing was seized up. Like I couldn't even move the, the jaw at all. And the trigger would move back and forth freely, but the jaw just seized up solid. And is simply due to the, the different environment, having the salt air and the humidity and that kind of change what, that we never see up here in North America. Um, and you notice it across the board with a lot of mechanical parts in that area. Like you just notice it with everything, the way that fuel gums up in weird ways, the way the vehicles start, the way that they, um, you know, break down regularly, just lots of different things. Yeah, it was wild, man. You were talking about um, your release coming up, huh? It was the strangest thing, Brian. Like, I've never in 20 years seen anything like it. Like, my release simply didn't work. Froze up solid. You can chip ice with it. It just wasn't going to work. Um, I had to uh, put some, uh, like, gun oil on it luckily there was a sheep hunter in camp bought his cleaning kit with him and i was able to get it working again with some you know with some gun oil um but i've never had it was such a um you know a different thing to have happen and there's always things you got to prepare for them but the thing is, is i brought uh, two releases with me intentionally just you know always preparing for some type of a failure and it happened to both of them so it wasn't just that i mean things on the vehicles are breaking down constantly, uh, just different things that you wouldn't really think of mechanically, especially anything that was lubricated or had some type of a moving part. 
um, even sunglasses would start to like freeze up a little bit like the arms and the sunglasses it's an interesting deal but living out of a tent for a month uh, allowed me to kind of see what the holes in my game were see what i had planned properly for the other part of it that was probably the roughest part is no shower for a month <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the psychology behind a warm shower, my friend. <laughs> yeah, that's um, yeah, it's uh, that's challenging yourself in different ways, right? It's like hunting a a new habitat, hunting international, and then um, yeah, like just different conditions, and you're not sure what you're gonna come up against. Like you have these skills that you've worked hard to be able to obtain, but uh, there's things that you learn in these different places, um, lessons that you learn that Mother Nature will teach you, and so. It's like the great thing about like the mule deer course that I put together, the the um, gray light app that you've put together is these guys can really cut this learning curve. And, you know, it it's like we're sharing information that has taken us decades of um, commitment, decades and, and thousands of dollars of, of gas money. Like you told me, not sure if we got it on recording or not, or maybe it was before I hit record that you're going on a, a huge trip to check on a bunch of different mule deer states, mule deer places to see how their habitat's going. And so these guys really have a chance to cut this learning curve uh, just with a, a minimal investment. And I know in our early years, like, I read every mule deer book there was, anybody that wrote a book. I was trying to take in this information, but they if they had something like your app or something like the mule deer course or just all the information and podcasts out there, boy, I could sure cut that learning curve by probably decades. You know, you know what's funny about this too is as I always tell people like constantly, I wish every single person that was truly like great at their craft would follow in our footsteps with this i feel like you and myself i think there's like one or two other guys doing it something like a course uh to some degree i'm not exactly sure but i can't think i can't believe that just you and i are but i would want i would want to like learn from anybody i could just like you were saying i'd pick up you know, every book that I could, every magazine and just soak it all in. And, and um, nowadays with technology, I mean, it's at your fingertips, you know, you got property boundaries, states, game uh, management units, like everything just at your fingertips. I love the learning aspect. I think that what we know bridges the gap well beyond unit by unit. That's not, I don't think, as important as the strategy of how do you approach country and how do you approach um, your quarry given the geography that you're in and how you decide to hunt it. Um, and I think that having you know guys like us that are willing to put that out there, information that has taken you decades to learn and that you're putting into a course, People are going to find similarities, but they're also going to pick up intuitively on things that, you know, it's like tribal knowledge. You've built it over decades of doing it yourself. And as a result, you have this set of rules that may be similar, but it's a slightly different take. And I think that all of those angles help create better and more well-rounded outdoorsmen. I think that the promotion of you know, specific units, specific hunts in specific states is, is, in my opinion, ruining a lot of great things. But I think that creating proficient hunters through uh, wisdom and knowledge and allowing them to approach their own states and their own units with their information doesn't give away anything. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. And the fact that, you know, you do that in your courses too, without giving up exact hunting locations that have nothing to do with hey you know become more proficient at your craft is an excellent way to build skill set and uh, draw parallels and examples of uh, how you know two people that are completely different live in totally different areas but both very successful in their craft being able to have access to that is like a tap straight into the vein it's like a, an immediate the cleanest dough pit you can get, right? Like it's the information superhighway. 
And anybody who chooses not to or decides, oh, well, I'll do this, you know, for a little while. And, and then anybody who may think that they know it all uh, within the first month or so and then, you know, not do it anymore. I think it's a continued learning journey. And we're able to all learn from each other. And what better Petri dish than to tap into people who are truly dedicated to continuing to grow, build, and create an example as to uh, how to better ourselves in the, out- in the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think like the great thing, like we're similar in age. And so when we when we came up, like our our avenue for sharing information was like, um, you know, through magazine articles or through different things. But the, the thing that I think sets us apart or like, I think you have to pay attention to who you're listening to as well. And so you want to listen to people that have mastered their craft and that have spent the time in the field to be able to learn all these lessons, to share that information. And there's, there's so much information out there. And I think, you just have to look towards the source of where you're getting that information as well. Like it, um, you know, it does no good. Well, I mean, I, I think you can pick up and learn from anybody out there, but guys like us like to do it with a bow and arrow and we have specific seasons. And so, you know, for us listening to, you know, a rifle mule deer hunter, sure. We'll pick up some tidbits and tips as they have to hunt during extreme high pressure. They have to hunt during secondary living where these bucks really go and hide before the rut after Alpine living. So I definitely think there's things that you can gain and things that you can know, but there's so much information out there on the internet that I think you have to pick the right sources as well. Uh, The source is everything. I mean, kind of to your point, though, think about, and I could name a few places. I'm not going to go and name them because it's just not a smart thing to do, but I can think of several hunts, Brian, that both of us do that are during general rifle seasons, and mm-hmm. we're talking with a bow. Um, so I think that if if you learn your proficiency, like I think that any species could apply. There's going to be nuances learning that species um and we'll talk about this in a minute but i'm like literally getting more and more psyched to dive into starting to chase my first elk um just because it's kind of like a frontier that i i'm i think i'm i never thought i'd really hear myself say this but i'm i'm thinking about diving into it um to to a to a test the waters degree right um but I'm, I'm starting to seriously put uh, leverage my points to, to actually start doing some research and putting in for all the states that I have. I have like 17, 18 points in a lot of states um, that I could start to draw, you know, start draw these good tags. And then I'm even looking at some over-the-counter options as well. But I, I think that if you learn to hunt something that likes to live on its own, that likes to keep to itself, that loves seclusion, that loves quiet, and it lives a secret of life. Um, and you can do that successfully. You can pretty much go out and hunt anything you want uh, successfully and strategically without barring the fact that obviously there are subtle nuances to each, each species that are specific to that species. Um, but I think a lot goes to be said for uh, your source, without question. Your source is everything. That's amazing, man. It puts a smile on my face to hear that you're going to embark on some elk hunting and just some, uh, it's a new venture and and you're going to find a lot of similarities and, and your skill sets are going to carry over to elk hunting really well. But yeah, I think that's amazing. It's like a check challenging yourself in different ways. And I, I also think with all this information, it's like easy to look at all this information or take in this information and and think that, um, think that, you know, it all, or think that, you know, enough to be proficient, but it really is like taking this information and being able to apply it to your own hunting. Like there is no substitute for experience and time in the mountains as well. And so I think it's learning from the information out there, but figuring out, uh, how it how it weaves into your own hunting style, how it weaves into your own hunting areas and your own hunting space. And you talk about, you know, mentioning specific areas like the 
the skill set of hunting mule deer and hunting big mule deer isn't finding somebody's secret location. The 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 secret to it is like building your skill sets to a point to where you're good enough to be able to look through the statistics and the odds, to be able to e-scout, to be able to scout on the ground, and then to be able to carry over your mule deer hunting skill set to maybe a different terrain that has more timber, or that's foothills, or that is desert, or that is high mountains, or like there's a lot of states off the radar now in my research and learning it 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 never stops it's it's i'm a student of the game the same you are as i'm constantly learning and improving and getting better and and i feel like the the more i improve these different facets of bow hunting and bow hunting mule deer the better chance it gives me at killing a really big one because when i find him i have a better chance at closing the deal or I have a better chance of finding them or finding the biggest deer inside a unit because I have all this experience doing it. And so I I think it's important to gain this information and to use this information at your fingertips, but then to go have your own experiences and to, to apply that knowledge to the woods, I think is so important. And I think that's what you do really well, man, is um, you've crafted your life to be able to spend a bunch of time doing what you absolutely love to do and that's why it's no secret that you find consistent success on next level bucks and i see as your skill set improves you're you're finding in closing deals on these big next level deer that you know maybe wouldn't have been possible seven years ago or 10 years ago you're really using your skills in a in a positive way to be able to give yourself the best chance at this next level success man it's beautiful to be able to watch from afar and see i um i think we're we're our own worst critics sometimes because you know i sit there and um i'm really tough on myself really 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 hard on myself I think I spent, um, I think I spent around a hundred and little, uh, about 102 days, actual hunting days in the field this year, something like that. And, um, work suffered, obviously, you know, lots of things suffer when you, when you dedicate that much time. And I, I put a lot of time toward, uh, you know, trying to, find something over that 200 inch mark this year uh spent a lot of money doing it too um which is a whole nother story i wanted to discover a part of the world that is what i would consider some of the southernmost reaches of mule deer habitat um that exist in the world that's the last true remaining wilderness on planet earth for for will you know for for mule deer that Honestly, some people have never even touched, which is kind of something that's wild to even think of. Um, You know, it turned out that that this year was a bad water year and uh, they got like two and a half inches of rain instead of six and a half to seven. But nobody keeps track down there in Mexico. So you talk about uh, even the outfitters that are down there, nobody's on the island full time. People are kind of like off living their lives and then they just show up in November and the hunts, you know, there go, there they go. By then they've gotten a little bit of fall precipitation. Uh, everything greens up a little bit. Nobody really knows what happened during the summertime. So you kind of have to just roll the dice and show up to a degree. Um, but I spent a lot of time and money and energy into chasing that passion and you know you don't always um you don't always get what you want but i worked really hard and arrowed you know a few a few really nice bucks and had had a great time like i i arrowed a 31 inch typical in the desert that uh is a, a low 90s deer and you know he was we hunted really hard i mean i hunted gosh i scouted 23 days before i even hunted and then once the rut started the deer dispersed and began to like um you know just go after doe groups and you'd lose bucks for a week at a time and i had a heck of a hunt and a really great time and and you know he is an a public land giant like he's a public land giant he's not over 200 but 
he's a stud. And, and so with that said, like, I have a tendency to be really hard on myself because I, I really am hungry for a certain type of animal, but it doesn't take away from the experience and the hunt and, and everything that, you know, we did a field. Um, I enjoy it so much and I'm so in love with the process. I know that I'll get there eventually and uh, just doing my best to enjoy each moment and each hunt that I'm lucky enough to, to, to be given the opportunity to go on to begin with. Right. And it's, um, yeah, as, as we get older, it really is the journey, not the accomplishment. It's like, I've chased a lot of big deer and I've, I've killed a lot of big deer, but you know, the same as your heart on yourself, I am on myself as well. And it really is enjoying the time in the mountains, the adventure, the chasing a deer of that caliber. But there always is this this goal, like what drives me to get in my workouts or my runs or to shoot my bow is thinking about these giant mule deer that do exist out there, you know. And so I, I think that's a driving force. But but the beauty of it is, is you spent a hundred days like in the mountains doing what you love to do and you were present in the moment. Like it's one thing to spend a bunch of days, you know, doing what you love to do, but if you're not present in it and you're always worried about what's happening at home or what's happening at work, you're not truly enjoying it. And there is like some part of being a responsible adult that you do have to take care of things, you know, even while you are enjoying yourself, but to really be present in that moment and to find an incredible deer, like you found, like that's the beauty of it, man, is you're enjoying it along the way. And that, that deer that you're looking for, you know, that you've killed a bunch of nice deer and you will find that next level, but there's no shortcuts in this game. I see you putting in over a hundred days to try to kill this deer that you have your sights set on with scouting and hunting, like there's no shortcut. You're putting in the time and using your knowledge to the best of your abilities, but loving it along the way. And I think that's a big part of it is, you know, maybe in my early years, I was too driven to where I, I don't know that I was enjoying it or soaking it in as much as I am now. The, the country that these mule deer live in is part of the reason why we hunt them. They live in the wildest places on planet earth. That's like, a big part of the fun is being able to travel there and get our logistics right, keep ourselves safe, and then really challenge ourselves physically and mentally. And then, you know, killing a big deer is extremely difficult. And um, trying to get all that right, like I think that's a lot of the enjoyment for me. It it really is, uh, Brian. It, it it's, you know, um, so. There is no other way to hunt um, Tiburon Island other than to pay to play. Like, it, it's just not possible. You're mm -hmm. paying the theory Indians. You're paying an outfitter because you're not allowed to be on the island without an outfitter. And um, the one thing I did do is I requested the outfitter to basically I had to pay the outfitter to allow him to let me do it. Do it yourself. Just provide me with the vehicle and the fuel and, um, you know, off I go. I, um, you have to hire, uh, some of the Siri Indians, uh, as part of the, that's part of the deal. Like when you go to the Island, you have to basically provide some sort of, um, income or reason for you to be there for the Siri people, which is obviously, I think it goes without saying something that you should do without thinking twice. Um, they're amazing people. And, you know, I mean, I spent over a month on that island grinding it out. And I mean, I have grid lines all over that island of how hard I hunted it. Um, nooks and crannies of places that, gosh, you sit on some of the stuff, and you're not even sure if another human being's been on it or not. I mean, I'm sure there was, but uh, you overlook some of these basins and they're just so pure and pristine and remote and you watch these deer running all over the place and you can tell there was just monsters in there with crazy genetics like i saw nine by eights with little kickers and crap just going everywhere but you know 150 inch deer 170 inch deer like i saw a couple of really big frame deer with big flying cheaters coming off the sides that would have been a, just a monster on a non-drought year that was just like a solid high 70s low 80s buck and you're seeing these animals with age class and genetics, but you know, they didn't get the rain. And 
pass, 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 and having in your mind an idea of a goal that you want to achieve and ultimately be willing to eat your tag, spend all that time and spend all that money to just come home because it's, you know, 180 wasn't enough, 170 wasn't enough. And it, it wasn't that I could have arrowed that type of a deer. I could have probably brought five or six deer home that were like that. Um, and a lot of people might say, well, you know, just, just arrow one. So that way you have one of the subspecies. I mean, it's a, still a really great deer. And for me, I'm just like, I have my mind set. It's, it's gotta be like the deer. And, um, you know, I lived it. I actually lived that. And I spent a lot of time in the desert and a lot of time in the mountains this year. I had a really, really good high country tag this year like one of the best high country tags you could get and my experience from that hunt to be honest with you was um you know when you have that much hunter iq in a really small area of high country everybody is serious about trying to kill a giant and so if there's three big deer in that country you have you know 10 to 15 guys camped on each one and they're all screwing each other over um it's a very interesting subset of information and skill and ideology that goes into the strategy of how do you kill one of these big deer especially now with the way things are with information on different areas that you I personally am of the thought that it's better to put in the work, effort, and time into an under an undersubscribed area that has genetics, but that people really don't know much about and learn it and get to go back. And eventually you're going to see something that is worthy of, you know, your moment rather than some of these high prescribed units that are well known for producing the age class and the characteristics that you may be looking for. But there's so many people messing each other up that there was almost blatant disregard. Um, and to that point, you know, this year, early season, I had two bucks that were found. One was, I would say low 200, right kissing right at two. Um, and then one buck that was, uh, mid nineties and, um, it, it was all, but given the IQ of the people that were hunting them and their stubborn tenacity, like I scouted in July, August and right, be uh, right before the hunt. So I, you know, put in a lot of time and a lot of miles and I knew where there was four really big shooters. One was a, just a giant monster drop time that was in the low twos in a different area, but he literally had 18 guys on six different, well, there was either six or seven different camps. I don't know if one was just a tent down in the bottom for the heck of it, but I, I counted as many as 18 guys on that deer. And uh, nobody was there in July, but towards the end of August, um, two weeks before the hunt, like everybody was just camping and living on them. And it's like when, when, you have that many guys, they all think that, you know, well, I'm going on a stock opening day. And is what, what happened is everybody just kept pushing the deer deeper and deeper into the, um, into the willows until that deer just lived in the timber and basically didn't come out. And you had a bunch of frustrated hunters. Now, not all 18 of those guys were actual hunters. These guys would have three, four, five guys with them. And there was th probably three or four tags in that basin. But um, when you get that much pressure it doesn't matter if it's a, a highly limited draw tag that takes you 10 to 12 years to get it really uh kind of has a a way of making the experience uh bittersweet and i have a lot more fun going to units where people could care less that those units exist um where i can hunt a buck in peace find him and put an arrow in him and nobody be around um so there's a lot of different strategies out there and I definitely felt the full gambit of going into a hunt with high expectations in Sonora, Mexico, putting in over a month and lots of miles with myself set on a certain mark 
and not achieving it, but really finding a lot more in the hunt in that I fell so in love with the country, so in love with the people, so in love with where I was and the experience that I'm beyond happy to the extent that I want to go back every year if I can. And mm-hmm. so it's proof positive that that uh, the kill isn't everything, but that we do have goals for ourselves that we set as a priority. And, you know, as a result of it, that's why you run so much. That's why you're going to work out. That's why you're going to enjoy the outdoors as much as you can, because it keeps you tied and closely connected to the pursuit that truly gives life to each breath you take and allows you to dream for the ridges that you want to go over this season. Um, I can't speak highly enough to the experience, just like we always talk about. Yep. Yeah, you do... You do have to be careful of what kind of experience you're looking for. So I've also been caught in that too, like the combat hunting for trophy deer. And that is just not the experience, the adventure that I'm looking for. I killed a, a 211 in on the Wasatch front. But the Wasatch front, there was so many guys there. And as same as you, I had scouted this deer in July and in August. And there's nobody around until late <laughs> August, till the season's about open. And and then as soon as the season opened, there's guys on every vantage point, every ridge line. And like you say, these big deer, uh, they still live in these units, but he absolutely disappeared. I saw him twice in 10 days, 20 different sits, 20 different vantage points. I saw him twice and I was able to kill him the second time I saw him, but I got done with that experience and that place has that kind of genetics. And I saw other big deer and other big up and comers. But for me, it just wasn't right. It just, I didn't have the adventure, the experience I was looking for where I said, you know, I think I want to go find a different place in this state that nobody's paying attention to. And, and even if it takes me years to learn it, or even if I'm chasing 170 inch deer, it's going to be a better experience and a better adventure than me up combat hunting and seeing so many guys trying to do what I'm trying to do. So I like side with you there. And, and there are, you know, it doesn't have to be a good unit to grow a big mule deer. They grow throughout the West. Like you have the right genetics and you get the right age class, but there still is opportunity out there to go be an explorer, to go into these low point units. And I know you hunt a ton of low point units and, and, you know, like it, it just never ends for me, the research. And I'm always surprised at the deer that I can turn up. And so now years later, after I killed that big buck, now I finally found a unit that I really like in that state, uh, that it is more vast, that does have more wilderness where I can get away from guys that isn't known quite so much for the big deer. And, and I did, I chased some great deer in there last year and, you know, my issue last year, like I always look back and reflect on my hunts, what went right and what went wrong. And last year, you know, I'd lost a bunch of carpenters on my crew. I had burned a bunch of time hunting BC for goats, hunting another early mule deer hunt to where I didn't have the time to dedicate to that unit that I really needed to kill that big deer. He was in there and I was just so short on time and so heavy on responsibility that I couldn't spend the time in there. It's one of my regrets from last season. And so now as I look towards this season in the future, it's really trying to structure my life where I have that time to get back to those scouting days like you're talking about or those hunting days to really give myself the time and the chance to try to be successful. And so we're all adjusting our tactics as we go and, and figuring out what we like. And and what I love, like the Tiburone Island might be a pay to play but it, you fell so in love with the country and, and the possibilities and, and the genetics of what they can grow down there. Now that's going to drive you throughout the year to be able to work harder, to be able to make that money, to be able to go down there and have that experience again. And I think that's beautiful. Bro, you're hitting the nail on the head with all this. Like it's all things I think to myself when we're not on, you know, on a podcast together. And, and that's a lot of the reason why I love talking with you. Um, like, I love having the opportunity to spend time with you and just rehash some of this stuff because it gets my mind thinking too. And the reality of it is, is that, like, I didn't know this when I started hunting. I, I thought, you know, oh, um, I'm just going to do this for, you know, for fun. Um, 
you know, I have a job. Uh, I can ask for time off. I can leave. I can go hunt. And as I got older and matured into hunting a little bit, I said, well, if I really love this, I have to make some significant life changes. I think that's one of the the questions I get asked the most, Brian. How are you able to hunt so much? Geez, it must be nice. And and you know the funny thing of it is 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 um, there's been a lot of sacrifice along the way, like a lot of uh, hardship along the way because I I wanted to design a life. Um, where I could, you know, go and, and hunt as much as I do. And there's no other path in my eyes uh, than being an entrepreneur. I, I think that if you really want to dedicate your life to the hunt and you're really struggling with what your next steps are because you don't know what product to develop or you don't know what skill set to build on, that as a young person that really wants to dedicate themselves to the mountain, there's a lot of other directions that you can go into other than being like a, an influencer or, uh, you know, blowing up hunting areas or showing too much country in your backgrounds. There's a lot of things that you can do that don't have to do with hunting in any capacity, but allow you to make a meaningful income and give yourself the freedom that you desire so that that way you're not making hunting a job. And for me, that's the biggest thing in all of this is that hunting is not a job for me. It's something that I love so much that I work at it like a job, but it's not how I make my money in any capacity. Um, you know, the, the, even to the point here that we're talking about the app, for example, the app doesn't make me a measurable amount of money based off of like what I do for a living as an entrepreneur. Like the app is maybe a little bit of gas money compared to like what my actual business can do. And so for me, the, the app is me trying more than anything to give back to um, something that a community that I love so much a way for me to express myself in an offline fashion that I'm not going to go in long format and express on, for example, Instagram. Um, it's a more of a longer format for me to go in and talk about things that I deeply care about. And if somebody cares enough about it, like I do, then, you know, it's worth a few bucks for them to pay to hear my, my side of the story, so to speak, uh, the same as it would be for somebody to go and jump on your course because you have a ton of intellectual wisdom. You've come away from the mountain so many times with a heavy pack. Like, why wouldn't somebody want to take Brian Barney's mule deer course? Like, you're kind of joking yourself if you don't want to. And if we really can, like, look in the mirror and strip it all away and get rid of the ego, like, that's a thing with, with, I don't know, our demographic, I think, in particular, is that there's a lot of ego. There's a lot of either, you know, uh, jealousy or on the other side of it, ego that prevents. But if we can just kind of dumb it all down and say, hey, like, I love you. Uh, everything's going to be OK. <laughs> like, we're all friends here. Like, we can support each other and, you know, know that um, we can support each other without giving up our secrets, that we can be good stewards and pay it forward in a great way without being um, like an attention hog. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said with uh, things that, that, you know, you're putting out there or that I'm putting out there that are beneficial to people. And I'm leaning more and more towards the experience the further I get along into this journey. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's exactly right. It is, um, you know, and the guys that, that it is their passion. It's like when it's your passion, it, it feels like almost like a purpose in life, like something you're meant to do. Like when I'm, when I'm bow hunting mule deer in the mountains, I feel like that's what I was put on this earth to do. It's what I enjoy the most. It like, uh, uh, it, it really fulfills my, my soul and my heart and, um, everything that I want to be doing. And so like, you know, for guys that have that passion for the outdoors or hunting mule deer, bow hunting or whatever the case is, it's like, 
you know, it's not the best way to make a living or it's not the best way to support a habit. And like you say, being an entrepreneur, it's like if you have such passion for hunting mule deer, then nothing's going to stop you from doing it. You're going to structure your life so you get that time in the mountains. And it's uh, an evolution. It doesn't – you don't just decide the first year that you want to bow hunt mule deer that you can take 100 days and go hunt them. It's going to take time. Uh, but I think that you know how you do one thing is how you do everything. And these lessons that I've been able to learn in the mule deer woods, the tenacity and toughness and persistent, and um, you know I've had to fail and pick myself up again and get back after it. And you know there's also jealousy and ego there too that I have to curb or control or that I have to to look at intelligently and be able to wrap my brain around that this isn't healthy to think this way, that I need to focus, you know, on myself and my own journey and what I'm doing. But I, I think if you have that passion, that's going to carry over into your work life. And so, you know, I think as bow hunters can show up and whether we work for somebody, you know, we can put forth full effort and work the weekends and evenings. And then we can have these conversations with our bosses about, hey, like, you know, bow hunting means everything to me. I'm going to need these two weeks off. I'll do whatever it takes to make this work. Or if you're an entrepreneur, it's like, you know, your your work life is cut pretty short when you spend 100 days out bow hunting like you and I do. And so then you have to make really good on those other 200 days that you're working, that you have to get things done. And so, you know, for me, it's like I'm working a couple, two, three jobs. And so burning the candle at all ends. So I'm really efficient with my time in the mornings and during the day and in the evenings. And it's not you know, I love my work or I love like being able to accomplish things, but that's not where my true love is. It's bow hunting mule deer. And so this is all towards structuring my life to be able to have the time to do what I love to do and then have the presence of mind as well to know that, you know, I'm responsible, that I took care of everything before I left, that my family's good. My, my wife's been through this and she knows that she's handling everything at the house and I know everything's all good. And so I'm so present in that moment and in that time and space where I can really put all my energy into it. And, and that is where I feel most alive. And that's what drives me the rest of the year. And what I'm thinking about every single day is being able to spend that time doing what I love to do. But I think these traits that we're building, this love that we have, this passion that we have, uh, I think it, it drives us in all facets of life. There's no question that that kind of brings me back to the beginning of when we just popped on here like as we get older life becomes more complicated the more uh you know we desire for the simplicity but i'll tell you what like there's little things here that kind of you know prove our point a little bit in that probably, probably a lot more than a little bit and very convincing like i don't like to go to the grocery store for my meat just putting it out there i, I if i can get something that was on the mountain free range I know it's an expensive way to procure my protein, but uh, I would rather eat something from the mountain or from the ocean far before I'd, I'd want to eat something uh, from a grocery store. And, you know, like I said, I could go grocery shopping, I can pick up a rifle and shoot a, a meat buck, but there's so much more that goes into this and what we want out of it. And there's another aspect of this that... Um, you know, there's no more first day jitters. There's no more first day of school here. This is classes way beyond in session. You have um, you have your PhD in being an outdoorsman at this point. And you're not waiting for your left nut to drop. You're not waiting for somebody to give you approval. You're not looking for approval. You are a part of a movement, something that needs what I would say needs stewardship, needs ambassadorship, needs representatives to paint the picture of what we ultimately are doing out in the woods to truly be, especially in the light and in the face of so many that may oppose us uh, as as not as hunters, as outdoorsmen as out, outdoorsmen and women, as stewards of the land, like people who truly connect, resonate, and enjoy open places in the mountains that utilize and leverage it for much more than just watching a waterfall, but that are connected in a self-sustaining manner that hearkens to people that did it way beyond us 
three, four, five hundred thousand years ago uh, and connect in a way where you can look down, pick up an arrowhead or a piece of pottery and and see yourself in that moment. And for me, um, especially in this day and age of polarization where, you know, you look at different media outlets and you see things from the aspect of, well, you're either conservative or liberal or you're on this agenda or that agenda, meat is murder, or, you know, just all the different things that are out there. I seek connection and I seek to be a voice of reason that can actually have a conclusion based off of more than just my desire to kill. Hence, you know, sometimes I don't do a lot of killing, but it's not for that. The resonance that's within you and the reason why we do this is what makes you uh, such a good person to be in the position that you're in. And, you know, I see it that we need more people like you that are interested in telling that story so that others that don't understand can synthesize it and react to it in a way that's non-emotional from a perspective of only seeing death from a perspective of understanding why you do what you do and how it connects you to the land and our forefathers and paying respect to everything that we hold near and dear to our hearts and here, here's a, a small little piece before I, I get off of this rant in mexico there's no such thing as public land you can't go to blm you can't go to um, any uh, forestry or park there's no place for a person to go and be on public lands in mexico you are on private land no matter where you hunt so you can't just take the family and uh, go for a hunt somewhere it's not possible uh, the tags are all given out based off of your ranch and the biologist does a study uh, to see what the carrying capacity and the holding capacity and the recruitment was like on your property. They issue tags based off the management objective of talking to the rancher and the carrying capacity. And you pay to play because of that. Here in the United States, let us not be blinded to the fact that we have not only a beautiful country to live in, but we have public lands to enjoy it's worth protecting. Yeah. hundred percent, man. That is worth protecting. That's beautifully said. Like I love, you know, we do need leaders and, and, and we do need stewards of this, um, outdoor lifestyle or, um, you know, it will go away or, you know, we can also destroy it from the inside out, the the jealousy and things. And I think it's important to be able to state that, yeah, I, I've had those feelings, too, where I get jealous. And it's not, you know, comparison is a thief of happiness to be worried about what somebody else is doing when I have 10 days to spend in the mountains for myself to go have an adventure is the wrong way to look at it. So I, I think like. Like me and you have been doing this long enough where we come to terms with our own ego or we come to terms with jealousy or or we come to terms with what's right for outdoorsmen and backcountry bow hunters. And so I think being able to spread that same gospel to young guys that are coming up, I, I think it makes like a better informed group of bow hunters out there, a more respectful group of bow hunters. And and like you were running into this year is the guys wanted the that giant buck so bad that they were they were willing to make hap, haphazard plays at this buck or spook them and blow it up for everybody. Or they were willing to disrespect the other guys on the mountains to give themselves a chance at success at this giant buck. And that's not what it's all about. It's like um, you know, having respect for you know, your fellow man that's out there bow hunting and to come up and to make a game plan with somebody at a trailhead, you know, to to talk it over and say, hey, I was thinking about going and checking out these basins. Which way are you headed? Or just to have that respect for somebody else or to see that somebody else is on a deer and to not rush in and give that deer your wind and blow up the whole scenario for everybody. Like th there's a better way to go about things. And we do have this public land, which is this, uh, great renewable resource. This uh, uh, North American model of conservation is a beautiful thing, but we want to make sure that we don't uh, that we don't ruin it. 
and and we want to make sure that everybody has a chance at those experiences. And I think there's still opportunity out there in 2024 to go find your own places and find your own units and find your own deer. There, there's an opportunity to be respectful to other people out there and to carry on this longstanding uh, tradition. And like you said, the connection, like, man, I, I killed this bull two years ago that was a great six point in my home range here in Montana. And I got done killing that bull and I packed him out. My buddies helped me. Uh, it was a tough pack out. We got him out. And then that evening they were still hunting. And I figured, well, I'll let this bull cool down and I'll go grab a vantage point and I'll go look for these guys and glass for these guys. And I'm up at 10,000 feet in like one of the most beautiful mountain ranges that I've spent 20 years hunting. And I go out to that vantage point and on top of a molehill, there's an obsidian arrowhead like sitting oh. there right on that dirt molehill <laughs> that night that I killed that bull, dude. And the connection with my ancestors, them doing the same thing I was doing, like out there by myself out on this vantage point after I killed this great six point bull and finding that thing was just amazing, man. It's like um, there's there's still room for those experiences out there and for everybody to be able to enjoy themselves. But, yeah, we definitely need good stewards and good leadership. And we need to talk about these difficult conversations and and you know be vulnerable and be able to admit our shortcomings as well because other people grow from them so that's why i think like these conversations are like so important for the guys coming up for sure it is i mean you you can't sit there and say uh in in any type of capacity that what has been done for thousands of years the flame should just be put out if you if you were to fractionalize the information that you're hearing right now like and and take eternity is not even eternity but since the beginning of time and how humanity provided for themselves and fractionalize how small of a period of time people have, are trying to extinguish self-reliance really that's really what it comes down to it's a disconnection of what it is that it takes to provide for oneself and associating that with death and an emotional cry rather than an association with how we've provided for ourselves and what needs to take place for a human to survive. I think that the bare bones essentials are that hu human beings should be taught that death is a part of life, that uh, none of us can survive without taking. We all have to take to live. And if there can be a conversation that is it, it can be emotional but not emotionally charged like you can sit there and say i had a moment when the arrow went through this animal that i respect the life that it had that it provides me with its the nourishment of its flesh that i respect the moment of its life and that it's going back to the earth but that i have reverent appreciation for it i think those conversations are are very important in making sure that what it is that we love doesn't get undermined um, to the extent that we're talking about not just tradition, not just heritage. We're talking about um, how each and every human being on this earth, our truest and deepest, most, the furthest back we could comprehend, is um, providing and that that association needs to be connected with our young people and the people that are getting into this for ego and clout I mean a lot of that's there I mean I'm not gonna lie like when I kill a 190 inch buck with a with with a bow in the desert like I'm pretty excited but I can't say that I don't sit there and think I'm the man like I don't think oh man I'm so awesome I there's not that had never even would even cross my mind. I'm sitting here going, wow, like what a stud this thing is. He's an old man. Um, he's he's you know, he's smart. He's lived a long life and he's bred a lot of those and he's had an opportunity to pass his genetics along. Um, I didn't take something that never had an opportunity to live. Um, I feel like I accomplished a goal in taking a seasoned warrior off of a mountain 
to provide for myself. And in that accomplishment of being able to arrow something so smart uh, and, and had years to prepare for these moments to get in his backyard to be able to take him in his bed was a challenge. And, and so I think of those marked moments, not, oh, look at, you know, how big this buck is that I killed. Like, there's always going to be a bigger buck and there's always going to be that somebody that can uh, be bigger or badder or, or, you know, than us. So I, I don't look at things like that anymore. And, and I hope that, you know, maybe this discussion can uh, encourage and foster other people to to not just look at a couple of old guys rambling saying, OK, whatever, old dude, shut up. But to sit there and say, OK, you know, these guys have obviously have the credit to speak on this topic. Maybe we listen a little bit and take something from it and apply it to our life. Uh, in a way that'll a allow us to become an entrepreneur if we want to to have faith and believe in ourselves that the road is is not necessarily easy that it's fraught with challenge but if you stick with it and you never quit um, you know you're gonna end up with the time that you want to go on all the hunts that you want that if you put your mind to something that you know you can be very effective uh, with your uh, bow hunting pursuits that if you uh, put as little as uh, the cost of a, a tank of gas per year towards your course or my app that uh, you might be able to pick up a few things that make you more efficient hunter. And that if you do it with as little ego as possible, that like I get a good enough pump in the gym to where my endorphins are running that I don't need anybody else's approval. My bow in my hand in the field uh, shooting an arrow true to be able to pack out a heavy pack several times a year. I don't need anybody's approval. Um, and working with really good people in the industry that believe me, believe in me and support me with amazing products. That is, you know, beyond gracious of them. And the appreciation is immeasurable to like my, you know, just my overall just gratitude for people seeing something that maybe I didn't even see in myself from the beginning that if everything is ushered in with gratitude and respect for what we do um the perspective can hopefully shift a little bit that's um very thought out and very well said like I I don't like gosh I can just wrap my brain around everything that you said and it resonates like with me to my core like um man it, it is like um it's directly tied to our dna and our survival as human beings and so that excitement to procure meat or to be able to provide is real and you know i also think that that line can get blurry of doing it for the right and wrong reasons doing it for the clout or doing it for the approval of others and so you have to be careful there because uh, when you do accomplish your goals or people are impressed by you, it's it's not going to be fulfilling. Like living a fulfilling life is like doing something that you're truly passionate for. And the challenge of like that giant desert deer that you arrowed down there with your bow and arrow, the challenge requires that we work year round at this pursuit and have put decades into it and and that we work tirelessly and, and the effort that's involved, like – it is the ultimate challenge, and so it, it, it's part of what means so much to us when we are able to accomplish it to ourselves as we know what we put in. And, and to have passion for something like bow hunting, man, it's like we're the lucky ones. It's like there's so many people that have anxiety and have depression, and so many people feel lost in life, and that's not our problem or our issue. We are not lost in life. We know what we love to do. What We know what we want to put our effort towards, and so that makes for a real fulfilling life is just having passion for something, and it doesn't have to be backcountry mule deer. There's guys that have passion for golf and passion for mountain climbing, and you know we're all individuals and find this uh the different routes to our happiness but i really think like finding that passion and i think we're lucky that we found ours and we've also found it found like doing it for the right reasons for the enjoyment and adventure and for uh the the challenge of it and and the work that goes into it and to be honest half the time i don't even want to 
post a buck that I've killed because I don't want to be braggadocious or I don't even want like I sometimes I can just like there's a lot that I just keep for myself. There's a lot of this experience and, um, you know, different things that I capture that never see social media or nobody ever sees them. They're for myself. And and I truly find enjoyment in doing it. And I think that other people can as well. And I think there's room for them out there. And so, um, you know, and it's also like thinking of my own life and living a fulfilling life and what makes me happy is I'm constantly adjusting that as well. As we talked earlier in this conversation about finding more time to, to scout and to hunt and being present in those moments. And so like, I I think um, we're definitely the lucky ones. And, and I, I I love like hearing you talk about gratitude and uh, I love hearing you talk about uh, the enjoyment of the hunt for you and, 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 and the, the sense of accomplishment, like all that just resonates so well with me. Like, um, with so many similarities, even though we live on, on different sides of the country or different States and different places. And we hunt some of the same places, but we also hunt different places, but we find that that same enjoyment in that same passion, like still burns so bright with us and to be, you know, getting up there in years and to still have such passion for life and what we love to do, man, I, th- I think that's, that's the real gift, you know, and I, I think other guys can find it as well. So I'm going to dovetail off of that a little, Brian, like if we owe so much, we, we owe so much to the quest of bow hunting. When I first started this journey, I, I didn't want to hike up a big mountain. If you just gave me a big mountain to hike up and there were no deer at the top, I'd be like, you are absolutely out of your damn mind. Like, I'm not going up there. That is insane. Um, But then you see a silhouette of a giant freaking rack up there on a buck that literally wants nothing to do with you. And you're like, oh, wow, that's food. And it comes with a cool freaking set of antlers to come with it. Like, the pursuit changes really quick. And it's interesting to see that evolution because now as I get into my forties, really mid forties. Now I, I sit there and I go, hunting keeps me young. Like the purpose is so vibrant and bright. It's insane. Like to see, you know, myself at 45 and stronger than I ever could have been in my twenties. Um, not, not stronger in that I wasn't dumb and couldn't run faster. S- stronger in that, if you give me a heavy pack and a big mountain, I'm not going to bitch. I'm just going to sit there and go, well, that's where we got to go until I get there. I ain't saying a damn thing, but going and getting there. There's a galvanization that occurs in you as a man. That man is a lot like some of the old ranchers that we run into when we're hunting. A lot like maybe if you had that father that was just like, this fortress of a human being that didn't budge on anything, but just got the job done. The people that say it one time only, and you better had your ears open. We're we're galvanizing ourselves. Hunting gave that to us. Hunting gave us this toughness that said, doesn't really matter how hard it is. Bitching and moaning isn't going to make it go away. And in a lot of ways, it allows you to define yourself. I feel very much so the same way that you do in that um, sharing certain things on social media can be difficult, but I decided I keep family stuff out of it. I keep certain things out of it just because to be honest, people don't deserve to know. And, and I believe that anymore that these apps are collecting so much data on us that they know what we're going to eat for breakfast almost. But I try and keep certain things as best I can, um, just to myself, but the hunt and the stewardship of sharing what it is to, to really give it your all and the process and getting there. I think I'm starting to share more and do more as a result of wanting to be someone that is not look at me, but here's what it takes. And let me share a part of my journey with you. If you don't like me, that's fine. I'll never change your mind. If you think I'm full of myself, I hope you would see that I'm not. But I'll never change your mind. 
you were probably not going to like me to begin with because of the way my voice sounds or because you think I'm overly con confident or too arrogant or cocky. But I will share something like over the years, I've had to galvanize and temper and almost, if you will, distill who I am as a human being. Refrain from saying a lot of how I really feel. To filter who I am in order to make myself palatable for the masses. The reality is that maybe 1% of the population could truly handle who I am as a person, as a human being, the intensity, how truly wild of a person I really am, how the wild just rings in my eyes. And if you're my friend, you'll know exactly what I feel the moment that I feel something because I have something to say about it or I'm gonna do something about it. I'm very extreme. I'm very um, strong-willed. And I think that what separates somebody like you from a lot of other people is just they're not willing to look in the mirror and see and hear the truth. So I end up saying about 10% of what I really feel. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that as a man that goes up into the mountains with confidence to be able to come out of there with a heavy pack, it doesn't mean you have to be... Uh, you know, an egomaniac, but you have to be confident. You, you have to like, you have to go, you got this, whether you look in a mirror or not, whether you talk to yourself in your head, you have to tell yourself, you don't have to say you're the man, but you have to sit there and say, I have prepared for this. I've trained for this. I know what could come my way. And I know that I'm tough enough to get it done. Because if you sit there and in any capacity, doubt yourself Pl plan for so much failure and nothing but failure and maybe a little bit of luck to kick you in the ass every now and then and that's the reality the reality is is you have to already know you're the the man before anybody else has an opportunity to tell you whether you are or not because if you come off the mountain consistently and not just luck like dude you know you're the shit and and I don't I don't want to be I don't care if I am I don't that's not my desire I I could care less about that part of it. the ego part I'll throw it in the trash, but you have to be a confident woodsman otherwise you're going to get your teeth kicked in, and more times than not you're not going to get an animal so if anything go to the gym seek endorphins look better for your your mind and body to feel confident in who you are as a man to the tool and the skill set that you're building so that way you can at least start to have situations on the mountain that challenge you that you overcome as obstacles that galvanize you that create an experience of consistency that will breed results in the hunt in life in everything you are as a friend as everything else kick the ego out of it but like having genuine real conversations with yourself that allow you to know that you can get it done because you just built the person that you are Yeah, it's um man, that's um that's so it. It's like if you don't believe in yourself, who's gonna believe in you? You know, it's like uh you you have to find that self confidence and belief in yourself. And it isn't a false belief. It's a belief because you know you put everything into it. You know you put the time and energy into it, or that I know I'm a good bow hunter. I, I put I put my thousand hours into it or my 10,000 hours into it to become proficient at it. And so, yeah, it isn't a, a false confidence, but it is a confidence. Like uh, if you don't believe in yourself, who is going to believe in you? And so that does carry over in other facets of your life. And I, I really like how you choose to share. And I think you run like such a great social media, positive page. And we don't get to say everything we feel as, you know, like for me, it isn't worth it to get into an argument with somebody that doesn't like me on the internet the same way it is for you. It's like you're not going to change their mind. You're not going to change what happens. The only thing is that I'm going to get worked up or angry inside and want to get a one up on them by some comment that I write. That's not going to do any good for me. So I, yeah. I just learned my lesson that, you know, I don't need to say everything I feel all the time. Like I can hold that to myself and let comments not bug me or not rub me the wrong way to realize that it is social media and it isn't real life or you know it is real life but it's not 
the same interactions you'd get face to face or in real life. So, you know, I'm fine with that. And I know that not everybody's going to like me and that if you are successful in life, you are going to have a few haters along the way. And that's just part of it. You have to be able to accept it. But yeah, it does. I think a mental toughness is like kind of like putting on muscle, like in the gym. It's like I, I can go you know, every day I'm adding these layers of strength to my muscles that can endure more. And the same thing with my mind, you're adding these calluses or these small layers of mental toughness. Every time you you go for a big run, every time you go on a tough hunt, every time you climb that mountain or you come back for it. And I think of it like as really adding these layers of mental toughness to really become who I, I want to become as a man, you know, and, and that's to be able to see my way through hardships and hardships don't always have to be on a tough mule deer hunt. Like that's going to carry over into life. Like we all have an expiration date and we're going to go through tough times and life isn't easy. We're going to deal with tough times with our family, with our work, with, uh, you, you know, like the only thing that's inevitable in this life is that you're going to see another tough time, you know, it seems like. And so you have to be good at handling those. But the more layers of this mental toughness, like the tougher you are, like the the better equipped you are to handle difficult things. And that's in the mule deer hunting woods. And that's also in life and in business too, like how many challenges do you get thrown at you in life? Like you're, you're working on a new studio right now. Like, I'm sure there's been more problems building those studios and things that go right. That's just the way construction is. And that's the way life is, you know? So the, the better prepared we are for that, like the, like the, the, the better we're going to be able to handle these difficult things that get thrown our way. Bro, you said it perfectly. Like, as an entrepreneur or a su successful hunter, like you're all you turn into, it's it's just being the better problem solver. That that's it. Like if you're if you're good at your if if you're good at building or growing the business that you are in, it's because you're good at problem solving. Like whenever somebody comes at me and says, and it's constantly like, oh, well, that's a problem. Oh, well, that won't work because of this. Oh, well, you know, my entire life, I've always been the person that says, oh, well, we could do this. Well, this will work. Well, that 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 here will, will solve for that. Like my entire life, I hear problems and all I hear are solutions in my head. And and that, I think, dude, that is such an aha moment right there for people listening. Like, I think that that is the key. Become a professional problem solver. A lot of your problems are going to go away. Um. You, you you know that's a huge thing to focus on and here's another thing that i think would be interesting think on this for a second it doesn't mean we have to act on it but take our mindsets brian imagine if you and i had a class of people in real life and we had 150 pound packs and we had a thousand foot traverse to do in a mile like how many people in that class would do it even if it was for free how many people would pay for our time to suffer through something that we have to teach the the reality is is that it's not toughness so much as it is our ability to face difficult things and say that's okay i'll get through this um you know not not miss your family too much to go home early not allow doubt to enter your brain not be unwilling to m move or waver from things that your brain will allow itself to become soft at so those 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 are a couple of really kind of neat things there that I kind of picked on with what picked up what you just said. Yeah. That's um that's it, man. It's um man, problem solving. It's like, you know, you just said it. It's a, a lot of these hunts, even being experienced, even seeing so much in the mountains and seeing success. Like it's still just high level problem solving back there. Like your hunt in Colorado was perfect example. There was a bunch of guys chasing those deer that you scouted where you just had to problem solve to be able to kill one of those deer, to be able to go look 
for another buck in a different area or whatever the case is. And and these bucks can be so difficult to kill that you can look at them on a feeding feature or on a bedding feature and you can look at it and say, well, there's no approach to them. Or, uh, but if you really get down to it, it you can – if you're a high level problem solver, you just figure it out and you just don't accept defeat or you don't accept failure. It's like, I'm just going to find a way, like whatever, I'm going to try this out or I'm going to wait till he gets to a better spot. And it, it's a way like you don't shape everything to be in this positive light. Like uh, a, a lot of people think that, you know, that I'm, that I'm really positive and I am. And it's not that I don't, you know, see failure or have hardships, or it's not that I don't come across these same hurdles. I just figure it out. I get into an area and there's a bunch of guys in there. And, you know, instead of going home or cutting in early, I'm looking on my map for the next place to go. I'm not afraid to move my camp. I'm not afraid to drive to another trailhead. I'm not afraid to keep hiking back, but I'm going to keep problem solving and keep theorizing uh, of how I can come out on top of this deal in, until my final minutes of the hunt, you know, and, and it may, it doesn't always come together for me. I do fail on hunts. There are, you know, hunts where I don't arrow a buck or I don't arrow a bull or I don't come home with my goal. But I can guarantee that I fought till the last minute and I never gave up hope. Like I was just looking for a, a sliver of opportunity. And and I think like having that mindset or that grit about you to like always come up with your next play or the next solution or uh, theorize of what the next move is. I, I think that's like the reason we see a lot of the success we do is just that mindset, man. I really do. For sure. There's there's one one aspect of it I'd love to touch on for a second. And I think that, you know, for you guys listening, make sure that this isn't you. This next statement. Do not be the person that has paralysis of analysis. Like, don't be paralyzed in your inability to decide because you're analyzing something to death. Most of the times the best cooks are the ones that get thrown into the kitchen. And a lot of times, if you want to be good at something, you just got to go and figure it out. Um, that has to do with like a new unit, a new state that has to do with a stock that has to do with just about everything. You'll never know enough until you've garnered the wisdom to achieve. Like, and that wisdom to achieve is something that you're going to fail a lot at. So no analysis uh, paralysis. Just get after it and fail enough that you start to suck less and start winning more and win your way to win your way to consistent success and victory in in everything doesn't matter what it is i don't care if it's providing for your family that's a huge win providing for your family to the ability to where you get to go hunt because you've figured some things out and you didn't analyze things to death to where you never executed on it so just go like just go and don't be the guy that has analysis paralysis that's so true, man. I'm uh, I'm such a doer. I'm just in action. And you have to be decisive. And they're not always going to be the right moves. Like, you're going to make mistakes, but you have to make decisions, right? Like, you have to decide or you have to come up with theories and then act on them. I'm, I'm such a doer that, you know, maybe sometimes I should sit around and think about it a little bit more. But I also don't want to second guess it and think, like, you can always come up with an excuse. You can always come up with an excuse why a stock's not going to work out or why a hunt's not going to work out. There's always an excuse to use why you couldn't find success. But if you if you stop using these excuses and you just be decisive and just go do, like it's not going to come out right all the time, but it will come out right eventually. For sure. Repetition creates uh, patterns uh, for success if you're paying attention. Like every time you don't win, which I spent a lot of my life not winning, like I spend I spend more time in my life losing than I do winning. Think about that for a second. I've spent more time in my life losing than winning. Like a lot of the stuff that people see is our highlight reel. 
And I think that's important for people to really understand. Like nobody is incredible all the time. You lose a lot and you lose enough to sit there and say, you know, that's where humility comes in. But are you willing to do the work to be able to reach the point where you have humility to where you start to understand that, well, no, you don't just suck anymore. You have put in the time and now you're actually good at something, but you've failed a lot in order to become that person. And are you confident enough in yourself as a human being to put yourself out there in a way that people could digest to be vulnerable enough to share the fact that, you know, you're not always a winner, that sometimes you lose, sometimes it hurts, sometimes you don't want to get up early, sometimes you, you're not feeling the best, but that you do it anyhow. And um, that there is a lot of practical, you know, answers for people in that, I think. Yeah, that's, um, that's exactly right, man. It's like, um, failure is the prerequisite to success. And, um, yeah, I failed a lot more than I've won. And, you know, people think of, a, a you know, like, a guys that are proficient at bow hunting, like you and like me that, oh, those guys are so money under pressure or, or clutch in the moment. And it's like, well, yeah, but I, it's because I failed in the moment a lot. It's because I've messed it up. And when you mess it up and it means so much to you, it cuts really deep. And so it's like a like a, a really good lesson that you don't want to make that mistake again. And also like being humble and honest, like when you do make a mistake is not to make an excuse to protect your ego, to really look at the situation and look where you messed up and how you can get better. But um yeah, I'm I'm only clutch or good at seizing those moments because I failed at them so many different times and easy moments too, like easy shots or easy stocks, uh, you know that I that I kicked a rock or I moved too quick or uh, I I didn't fall into my execution of my shot and it was a close shot and I punched it off and the arrow didn't hit its mark where it was supposed to. Like I've made all those mistakes, uh, dang near a hundred times over. But eventually you get good in those moments and good at seizing those moments. But nobody's born with it. It's something that you got to go spend your time out there and, and you got to go fail and you, you got to go mess up and you got to feel that hurt and feel that pain. And then eventually, you know, you get it right. You learn from those experiences. You get better. You grow as a person. And then you are clutching that moment because you've messed it up three times before that. And you know that you need to think about your execution and execute a good shot or whatever it is get a good range or all the you know those details that come together to be able to arrow a trophy buck but man that's exactly it yeah i've failed more than anybody else out there than you know than maybe you or like uh me for maybe like uh have failed more than you have you know but that's like the guys that are really successful have failed a lot and so don't beat yourself up over it you get back after it pick yourself up figure out what you did wrong uh recalibrate and get back after it because eventually it'll come together that's that's really it. And there's a ton of people out there that really want to be something, that want to like make a name or that want to like prove their worth or whatnot. They killed one giant buck and got a ton of followers, or they killed one giant bull and now they've, you know, got insta famous because of a big bull or something, whatever the case may be. But you know, it's when that person repeats it over and over and over and over again to where it's almost like, I'm just waiting to see what they kill. Like, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when are they going to show it. Like, those people, I think, are the ultimate failure artists, really. They just learned how to take defeat and sucking and realize that, well, if I stop now, I get nothing out of this. And I certainly am not going to get any venison meals, so I better keep going. And when you're able to repeat it and control the process of how it's repeated, that I think is the magic spot, man. <laughs> that is like, that's when it's just... It's so, it's like a feeling, it's like a vibration more than it is anything else. It's really special. It's powerful. It's self-confidence. It's yeah. knowing that you have what it takes to be able to, to um, make it come together. 
Yeah, it is beautiful, man. It is a, a power, a, a superpower of vibration. It is a, a feeling. And you just know that you have what it takes inside to make it happen. You've been there enough times. You've failed enough times that that you know you're ready for that challenge. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a special place, man. It is a really amazing place to arrive at. Mm -hmm. That's what a a lifetime of work will get you, right? And dedication. That's the only thing that I can. you know that that's where now i i look to i think that's where maturity in the animals and like maybe i wouldn't even say score but just you know size of an animal kind of starts to define a little bit more because it's more challenging to find that one and put that one on the ground the hunt can evolve with you but it's not for the score i could care less about what the number is on the rack but the find consistent success on the older age class larger animals becomes more of a defining pursuit because it is that that takes the, that level of difficulty and just ups it a little bit more every single time and now it's to a, a place where I do enjoy um I enjoy rubbing shoulders with you I enjoy talking to you about these things because let's face it i don't get to have this conversation very often except for when i'm talking to you um you know the conversation is is not geared so much around this it's you know more about in my own head by myself on the mountain and how i feel and not really the brotherhood or or sharing it so to speak and so um it's with a very reverent heart that i'm able to get an opportunity to that you give me uh, you know, an opportunity to to speak with you uh, on your platform that I respect and um, the audience. I respect all of you listening. And so it's with a very reverent heart that, you know, I get to take time out of my day and, and share it with some really special people. Uh, what, you know, honestly goes on in my head that I don't get the opportunity to do very often. Yeah, it's um well I I appreciate it so much, man. Um you taking the time away from work, away from your family and being on and having this these like in-depth conversations and being so honest and so vulnerable and and really sharing the nitty-gritty of what it takes if you want to find that success or if you do have that passion and that love for the game, like um, what it takes to take it to another level. And and I'm not finished, and I know you're not either, like a student of the game. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting started, really. It's like a, I have a lot of big goals and big ambitions and things I want to do, and I just can't wait for the upcoming year and upcoming season to um, – go test myself in the mountains and, and, um, really have these long-term goals that I've worked hard for, for the, for the year and, and, um, really show, show my skill set and prove to myself like what I'm capable of. So, um, man, it's a beautiful thing. I, dude, I was so excited to have you back on the podcast because we have these conversations. It's like, um, my mind was just racing at work today, finishing countertops. Like, gosh, oh, what am I going to get into with Marlon? But really, all I need to do is hit record and get talking with you, and it'll make for a really good conversation. But I just, um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, like coming on and taking the time, and um, how much I appreciate your friendship as well. And um, we really need to make something happen in the mountains and go spend ten days together, or twelve days together, and um, see what we can come up with back there. Um, I think that'd be really fun. We need to follow through with that. Well, with the way, you know, tags are, are across the West are getting a little bit tougher to get. Um, I think that you and I can put our heads together and research somewhere that might take a couple years to get, or maybe not, you know, maybe something we can do sooner, but with the way things, you know, are happening across the West now, um, with allocation and and quotas and and winter kill and reintroductions, you, you name it. I don't think that's as far off or far uh, far stretched as as um, you know we might imagine it to do. I think it's just a matter of us getting on the phone afterwards and saying, okay, what do you want to do? I'm I'm all for it. Um, 
I'm not a, I'm, I'm the kind of guy you can put a heavy pack on and, and I'll keep going. Um, but I, I am definitely not the ultra marathon runner like you, but, <laughs> but I'm sure we can, we, you can wait for me at the top. <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, I, I'm not worried in the slightest. <laughs> like, uh, no, I think, um, I think it, it'd be a, um, yeah, a, a fun team. Like, um, I, I think we would have fun in the mountains together and I think we turn up some really good critters. So yeah, it is just a matter of hopping on the phone after we're done and planning something, and put it in the work. So let's do it, man. All right, brother. I agree. I'm all, all right. In. Really appreciate you. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate you more than you could ever imagine on a fellowship, on a brotherhood, on a human level, um, as an outdoorsman and, just as a really good friend. I, the, the moment I got to shake your hand and give you a hug, uh, at the show last year, I was like, man, I'm going to know this guy for the rest of my life. And, um, that won't ever change, bro. I appreciate you very much. And I appreciate the Eastman's for allowing us to have this platform to be able to talk on. I've appreciated them for years. Um, and I just, uh, I just think the world of the friendship. So, it, it it's very mutual brother it's really kind yeah um thank you all right let's um jump on that phone call and um we'll talk soon <laughs> roger roger all right guys that's a wrap yeah thanks for tuning in this week thanks to uh, marlin for being on the podcast taking the time and then sharing so much great information uh thanks to you guys for uh supporting this and downloading the episodes and um, we really appreciate the support. Just want to continue to bring you those really good recordings. So, um, yeah, I've been working hard to get on some new guests and uh, also looking at some returning guests just to get you guys the absolute best uh, information leading into hunting season. So thanks for your support. Thanks to Eastman's for everything they do. Uh, and check out everything we're doing there. We've got that mule deer course, too. Just pro- put in the promo code Brian MDC. It's pretty much everything I know about hunting mule deer, so you can check that out. And um, check out our Beyond the Grid. We'll have some new hunts coming up here. And uh, you search Eastman's Hunting TV on YouTube. Be good to go there. And um, everything that we're working on. So, man, um, yeah, just been working hard getting all my applications and permits in. Um, My um, credit card is not happy right now, or at least my debt load isn't happy. Uh, but I am, I do have my drawing and a bunch of hats for a bunch of tags. Found out I drew my special Montana elk tag last night. So that's pretty exciting. Starting to scout on that thing or at least do some e-scouting. And then I want to make some trips over there this summer. Uh, even though I know the unit well, uh, just want to see what type of bulls are over there and um, kind of which drainages they're hanging in and things. So yeah, going to do that, do some summer scouting for muleys as well, so I'm patiently waiting the draws here in other states, and um, yeah, just getting my workouts, I got that lift shooting really good, uh, so so impressed, got it uh, shooting good for outdoor, broadheads on, sight tape built, ready to go hunt bears, bears opened about a day ago or so, uh, so I got some early spots I'll go check out, so I'm getting excited for that, and um, man, yeah, just training and shooting, and um Living my best life here, trying to get some construction projects finished up and done. So, um, yeah, we'll keep working away here and see what I can do. Um, yeah, I know uh, a bunch of my buddies are getting after it. I know, um, like Hawaii, those axis deer will be coming into the rut here soon. So, starting to look at a trip out there to go hang out with some buddies. So, yeah, all good on my side. Life is good. So, yeah, just can't wait for this hunting season. It's going to be an epic fall. And, trying to get all my responsibilities done and um, free up some time to go have some adventures. So uh, thanks a bunch for listening in, guys. I really appreciate you. And with that, I'll check in with you next week.